We're going to read in our Bibles in the New Testament, in the letter to Titus, in chapter 1. Titus is on page 1198. Titus chapter 1, and we'll read uh, this whole chapter. If you've made it to Hebrews, you've gone too far. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Titus is on page 1198. We'll read from the beginning of chapter 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time and at his appointed season he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might strengthen, straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced, because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are by their action are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Amen. This is the Word of God. Well, we're going to turn back uh, and look at this passage that we have read. I'm going to turn to Titus chapter 1. And you can keep a, an eye on verses 6 to 9. That's where we'll spend most of our time uh, today. So we're looking at Titus chapter 1. I want to begin by asking you a question. And do you remember uh, the last wedding that you were at? Or maybe your own wedding. At any marriage ceremony, there is, uh, the minister there is primarily addressing the couple that are just a bit about or just have become husband and wife. However, that's not the cue for the rest of the congregation just to sit back and sleep or, or walk out because this has nothing to do with, with them. No, the counsel that the minister is going to give at that point of the service, yes, primarily is for the couple, but it's for everybody that's present. 
it's a reminder to all the, the other married couples that are there. And it is, is counsel for any who hope to be married as well. It is counsel of what God says about, about marriage. So it's important for all of us to hear. Today in this uh, special service here in Tain, we are addressing these men, these two men here in Tain, who are about to take up the office of an elder in this congregation. So primarily this sermon is directed to them, but it is certainly for everybody else here too. It shall serve as a reminder to all of our current elders of what is expected of them, not from the free church, but from the Word of God. What does God expect of these men as elders? But as we have read this chapter in Titus chapter 1, and what we're about to say from this passage, it's important for everybody here. It's important for all of us. We've got this uh, list here in, in this first chapter in verse 6 to 9. It's not a checklist to make sure that uh, you're gifted enough to become an elder. But they are in general qualities that we should all be striving for. All of us as Christians. Striving in our desire to be more like Jesus. These men are not becoming elders today because of their giftedness but because of their godliness whoever we are male or female whether we're the youngest here or the oldest whether we're the minister or the cleaner or the elder or the doorkeeper we are first and foremost Christians before we're anything else and as Christians we are striving to be godly to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And what we're doing here today in this service is very solemn. Uh, this is an important day in the history of Tain and Farn Free Church. It's an important day for, for these men and for their families. Yes, it is a great honor. It's a great privilege to become an elder in Christ's church. But along with that comes great our responsibility. See, when there is a problem in a church, and what I mean by that is not trifle issues, but deep-seated issues, then it is usually, almost always, it can be traced back to defective leadership. Whatever be the case. Heresy, in other words, turning away from the Bible, or a lack of discipline, if the shepherd strays, then the sheep are going to scatter. So what we are doing today in ordaining and inducting these men is solemn. God has set them apart. They have not been chosen at random, but rather over several months of prayer and discussion between the session, that's the meeting of the elders, their own willingness and you, the congregation's approval. These five men today, three in Hilton, two here in Tain, will be added to the leadership of this local church. And as the leadership pray for you, would you pray for the souls of your leader? I want to uh, glide over this topic of eldership today so that we can understand this concept a little better. I want to look at three things. Their personality, the pr their practice, and your promise. Their personality, their practice, and your promise. So we begin with their personality. And I want to start with uh, another question. What is an elder? What is an elder like? Well, here in verse 6 to 9, we have a list of characteristics and qualifications for a man to become an elder. I wanted to uh, divide that list into three parts today. 
Uh, my three headings that I've given are publicly, privately, and spiritually. Uh, I'm not very precious about these three headings, so no need to debate me afterwards, but it really just gives us a basis to work from. The characteristics are listed there between verse 6 and 9. And under publicly, I have put these, uh, these specific characteristics. That he is to be blameless. He is to be the husband of one wife. That he manages his children. He's hospitable and he loves what is good. These are under the public heading because... These are aspects of the man's character that are easily observable by any of us. When you look at these uh, that I've just listed, when we think about these men, we all know the answers to them. So, he is to be blameless. You know the answer to that. Is he? It's mentioned twice here in this list. It heightens its importance for us. To serve as a leader in Christ's church, you are to be above reproach. I'll say a little bit more about this later, but it does not mean perfect. These are sinful men. Men who have been saved from their sin because they have not run away from Jesus. They have run to Jesus. But they are to be above reproach when their name is mentioned in the streets of Tain there should not be legitimate scandal attached to it. And what about their wives? What about their marriages? They are to be the husbands of but one wife. Well, again, we know the answer to that question. None of them have two or three or four wives, but just one. We can see that. We know the answer. But on that topic, it it is not a requirement for you to be married, to become an elder. Rather, Paul, when he was writing this uh, letter to Titus, he was explaining to him, and he was writing into the context where many in, in, in Crete were having so many wives. Two, three, four, maybe more. But Paul was writing against polygamy, what that is. And he was saying, if you are to serve in the church of Christ You're to be a man with one wife. But then we come to this difficult, perhaps, statement in verse 6 about children. And we need to not misunderstand. It says in verse 6, Whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. We need to take a step back a little from these lists. And we need to ask the question, we need to ask the questions of the text, is Paul saying, even though these men perhaps have raised their children under the word of God, they've been brought up in a Christian home, and yet today, perhaps, their children are not Christians. They have not professed their faith. The question we need to ask is, does that disqualify these men from becoming elders in this church? Some might say yes. Well, we need to work these things out. I would disagree. I would suggest that Paul is saying, your children, to some extent, they are reflecting you as their father. They are mirroring you and how you have brought them up. If you have just forgotten to and disregarded the Bible in their whole childhood, if you have let them do whatever they want and never counsel them with biblical discipline, then that is going to reflect publicly. We are going to see that as a community of believers. We are going to see that in the church reflected in the children. But no, the people in leadership, they need to have their families under some kind of control. The degree that we uh, micromanage that will vary. But if someone does not know how to uh, manage their own household How are they going to manage the household of God? Surely, marriage and family, they provide the most probing analysis of a man's character. You see, what you are in your own home, what you are with your children, 
regardless of being the free church ministers, or regardless of being the free church elders, how are you in the privacy of your own home, irrespective of your public persona, the way you are indoors is who you really are. And then the last two qualities in that list are there to be hospitable and to love what is good. Is their home a place where friends and strangers are welcome? And not only do they do good, but do they love to do good? So there's these qualities under the public heading. But what about the private? Well, if from the from the characteristics in verse 6 to 9, under private, I've put, he is not to be overbearing or arrogant. He is not to be quick-tempered or a drunk or violent or pursuing dishonest gain. Allow me to just uh, pick out one or two of these. You may look at that list and think, how is that the private list? Surely if he was a drunk, we would know it. Well, let me pick out, first of all, quick-tempered. He's not to get easily angry. I say that that is a private quality because I wouldn't expect any of these men, these two men or any of you in this church, to go through into the hall after this service and to get your cup of tea, to be enjoying conversation with somebody when I come along and nudge into you by accident and your tea spills down your shirt. I don't expect you at that point to throw the cup of tea in the air and to start shouting and spitting in my face with rage and anger because this accident has happened. If it did, then we would see clearly and publicly that you are quick to anger. But what about in your home? That, I think, is where the greater temptation lies for some of us. When the world is not looking, when the church can't see, how do we react to our children? How do we react to our wives, to our husbands? Would your wife, would your children say that you are easily angered? Let me choose one more. What about drink? Paul says you're not to be drunk if you're to you're not to be a drunkard if you're to be an elder of this church. Well, again, uh, when we have the church curry nights through in the hall, I, I don't expect any of these elders. I don't expect any of you to turn up at that curry night and get drunk. It will be quite obvious that there was an issue with alcohol. But what about in your home? What about at the family Christmas parties? What about at the quiet Saturday nights by the fires when nobody from the world or from the church, the minister, will never find out? Then are you drunk? This is not a call to being teetotal if you're to become uh, an elder in the church. But it is a call to sobriety. It is a call to be ready. It is a call to serve Christ and his people. These are their personality. We come secondly to uh, their practice. Their practice. These characteristics, they force these men to examine themselves and I'm sure that the two of them uh, are doing that even as we go through this service this afternoon. The current elders have examined these two men and the other three in Hilton before their names were put forward. And now you as the congregation have done the same and you have voted. And each man has received a a majority of, of votes. And so they will take up this office. So they're going to become elders of this congregation. And yet I I don't need to tell you that these two men or any of your elders are perfect. They're not perfect. 
Your elders aren't. Your ministers aren't. But we pray that your leaders, these elders, these two, are godly men. Are they perfect? No. But we pray that they are godly and that they and we all would continue to grow in God's grace. I want to just focus in as, uh, on verse 9. But to do this, I want to ask you, do you know what your elders do? What happens to these men after they become elders today? What do they do? What are their tasks? Well, for starters, they will uh, join the other elders and they'll meet on occasion and will uh, have meetings together as elders. They'll also come and they'll visit you in their homes by uh, need or by necessity or by routine or by request. They'll come and visit you as part of this church. Two of them will go to presbytery once a month in Brora and one of them perhaps will even go to the general assembly of this denomination in Edinburgh once a year. They have the spiritual and they have the pastoral oversight of you, of this congregation and community. Do you know who your elder is? If you don't know who your elder is, then I invite you to find out. Find out so that you know who it is in particular that is praying for you and your family. Find out so that you know who it is you can turn to in these spiritual matters that come up in your life. Let me read verse 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Verse 9, it tells me that your elders, shepherds, they teach and they defend. They are a team of shepherds. They are a band of brothers working together. Not one going off here and one going off there, but together. Working together for your good and for God's glory in this town and our villages. My uncle has cattle. When we were younger, I was over at my cousin's house and we received the call from my uncle that we all as cousins had to come and help him move the cattle from one croft and move them into another down the road. Uh, I was not the tallest of young boys. And so as I came towards these cows, I was maybe a little frightened. He said, don't worry, they're more scared of you than you are of them. I wasn't convinced, but I, I trusted him to an extent. And we, uh, in number, tried to herd this cattle from one croft to the other. You see, this was not a task that my uncle could do all by himself. He needed more people. He needed help. And together, all of us got the job done. Your elders are no one-man band. Your minister is no one-man band. These men will not go off and do what they like themselves. They will join in the pastoral team. They will link in with the other brothers who are already in service as elders. And together they will work for the Lord in this place. As individuals and collectively, these men must hold firm, as verse 9 tells us, to the trustworthy message. That's the Bible. They must not swerve from it or detour to their own, and put their own spin in it. No, they will stand firm in what the Bible says and answer all questions and make all decisions in their elders' meetings based on the Word of God. But these men, with all respect, they have not got all of the answers. They are growing Christians. Just like you and I are growing, we are all on this journey and at different stages. In a few weeks, these men will uh, come and be part of training for the elders. That's not just for these five new men who are becoming elders today. But it is for me and some of these elders who are uh, young and inexperienced as, as elders in the church. And it's for our longest serving elder as well. It is for 
all of us because we don't grow past the need to learn. The amazing aspect of God's Word for all of us as elders or as members or as seekers. We don't grow past the need to know more, to learn more about Jesus and about what is in His Bible. We will spend all of our days searching and finding out more treasure that He has in His Word. As a student of God's word, your elders will come alongside you and they will encourage you. His desire is to share the sound teaching of God's word with you. So when he comes to your house and when your ministers come, the conversation shall not primarily be about the weather or about the planned trips that you've you've got in the summer. A wee bit. But the conversation shall center around Jesus Christ. And a question that he may often, or he may like to ask you, or you can ask him, how is it with your soul? How is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Their practice. Well, we come lastly then to your promise, to you as a congregation. As a congregation, you are observing these men being uh, inducted into the office of eldership. And I want you to promise three things as a result of this. I want you to promise to give thanks. Thanks to the Lord for his goodness to you as a community of believers. See, after today, Tain and Fern Free Church shall have 13 elders. 13 elders. And if you travel from this congregation and go north to the other Free Church congregations, you will find that they have four elders. The next one, one elder. The next four, two, none, none, two, two, and one elder. You have, you have 13 elders and two serving ministers. That's not something that we boast about here in Tain, but it is to give grateful thanks to God for. But we must remember to whom much is given, much is required. That does not mean because we have a plurality of elders does not mean that our congregation is growing so I can sit back and somebody else will do it. It means I stand up and together as a band of brothers and sisters running to Jesus every day, every service, every moment of our lives together serving each other in His church and in this town and in our villages. We will glorify God and give him all due thanks and praise. Will you promise to give thanks to God? Secondly, will you promise to pray? These men don't want a pat on the back today. They want you to pray for them. As a a Kirk session, we crave the prayers of the congregation as we seek which direction the Lord is leading us. We have seen growth, and with that comes great joy, but increased challenges and responsibilities. So would you promise to pray? But thirdly, would you promise to hold all of your elders accountable? This list of characteristics In Titus 1, verse 6 to 9, it's not just the list that these two men need to adhere to today. It is the list that all of your leadership adhere to every day. So will you hold them accountable? And it applies to these men and to your elders who are longest serving in this congregation. So give thanks for them, pray for them, and hold them accountable. Amen. We're going to conclude by singing in Psalm 133.
in the Sing Psalms. It's on page 175. Psalm 133, how excellent a thing it is, how pleasant and how good, when brothers dwell in unity and live as brothers should. Let's stand and sing to God's praise. mercy and peace from God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you both now and forevermore.